Well, this morning we're continuing in John's Gospel. We're in John chapter 7. We're going to be looking at verses 25 through 31. And let me read those for you as we begin. And as I've already told you, this has to do with questions that people had about who Jesus is, what the leaders thought about Jesus, uh, whether He could possibly be the Christ, what Jesus says about Himself, that He is the Christ, and of course, the division among the Jewish people. This is what we read. So some of the people of Jerusalem were saying, is this not the man whom they are seeking to kill? Look, he is speaking publicly and they are saying nothing to him. The rulers do not really know that this is the Christ, do they? However, we know where this man is from. But whenever the Christ may come, no one knows where he is from. Then Jesus cried out in the temple, teaching and saying, you both know me and know where I am from, and I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. So they were seeking to seize him, and no man laid his hand on him because his hour had not yet come. But many of the crowd believed in him, and they were saying, when the Christ comes, he will not perform more signs than those which this man has, will he? So ends uh, the reading of God's Word. May He bless it to our understanding this morning. Now, it's been said, as you know very well, that seeing is believing. You can try to convince me all day that something is true, but unless I see it with my own eyes, I won't believe you. Now, the question is, is that, is that really true? Now, isn't that what Thomas meant uh, when he told his fellow disciples when they said, we have seen the Lord? He says in John 20, 25, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. What did Jesus say to him in response? He says in verses 27 through 29, Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here with your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Now, Thomas thought he had to see before he could believe, but is that true? Well, obviously not. There were many Jews who actually did see Jesus, and they really did not believe in Him because seeing isn't necessarily believing. But there have been many, many more, not only in the days of Jesus, as we see in our text this morning, but throughout the history of the church, who never saw these things, and yet they believed even as Jesus said they would. Now, none of us here this morning, none of us have seen these things with our eyes, nor will we actually ever see them because the things we're talking about actually took place 2,000 years ago. And yet, many of us here believe that these things are true. We believe that Jesus is the Christ and we have trusted Him. And why have we trusted Him where others have not? Well, it's because God is merciful. I mean, God not only had these things that were done almost 2,000 years ago written down, and not only did He preserve it and give the Word to us, as you know, many of the people in the world don't have the Word of God, they're still in the dark, but He also sent His Spirit to open our eyes and to show us, to convince us that these things are true, that we may see not only the reality of these things, but the beauty of these things, the beauty of the Savior of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, and have received Him. But again, we acknowledge this morning, there are also some of us here who have not believed. You've read these things like the rest of us. You've heard the same things that we have heard, but you still have not trusted the Lord Jesus. And the question that we would ask is, why haven't you? Why haven't you believed? 
Well, we're going to consider some of the reasons this morning as we look at this text because it's the same reason why many of these Jews didn't believe. But of course, we're also going to look at the fact that you should believe. You have every reason to believe and you have really no excuse for not believing. Well, let's look at three things this morning. I want us to look at the three questions that the Jews asked about Jesus. Secondly, what Jesus had to say regarding himself. And thirdly, how the Jews were divided. So first of all, let's consider the three questions the Jews had about Jesus, which is, is this the one that our leaders want to kill? He's speaking and no one's doing anything about it. Does this mean that they believe he is now, or they now believe he is the Christ? And thirdly, how can he be the Christ since we know where he came from. So first of all, they ask this question, is this man the one that they are seeking to kill? We see that in verse 25. So some of the people of Jerusalem are saying, is this not the man whom they are seeking to kill? Remember, Jesus had come up to Jerusalem for the Feast of Booths. And there were many other people who were there who had come from all over the Roman Empire because this was one of the three mandatory feasts. Now, many of them had no idea what the leaders had intended to do to Jesus. They had no idea there was a plot to kill him. There were even many from Jerusalem who didn't know that that's what they were intending to do because remember we saw, I think it was last week in John 7 verse 20, that when Jesus asked the crowd, why are you seeking to kill me? They thought he was mad. But it's also quite clear that there were those in Jerusalem who understood that the leaders, or what the leaders had plotted against him, word was getting out that they wanted to kill him because he had healed a man on the Sabbath. Now, in the minds of the leaders, Jesus had broken the fourth commandment. And they understood that what God required for the breaking of that commandment was capital punishment. That was the penalty, as we saw last time, the man who was gathering wood on the Sabbath, and the Lord said that this man should be put to death, understanding also that mercy was also possible. Now, we do need to understand, if it wasn't for the mercy of God, all of us deserve to be put to death, and all of us would be dead. God is merciful because God says the wages of sin is death, and that means not just eternal death, it also means physical death, but of course eternal death is much worse. When we break God's law, it is, an, it is an act of rebellion against God. It's wicked. And that requires punishment. And of course, the, the gravity of the sin uh, is what dictates the gravity of the punishment. We've sinned against an infinitely holy God. We deserve infinite punishment. But since we can't suffer infinitely, we suffer eternally. That's what the wages of sin is, eternal death. Now, of course, the problem with the assessment of the Jews is that Jesus really didn't break the commandment. Uh, Jesus is the spotless Lamb of God. After all, everything He did was absolutely perfect. When He healed that man at the pool of Bethesda, He was actually honoring His Father. He was honoring the law of God, and He was honoring His neighbor by showing mercy to Him. That's something that the Lord calls all of us to do, isn't it? Especially on the Sabbath day. Jesus says in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5 verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. I mean, this is actually what God requires of us at all times, but especially on the Sabbath, that we love our neighbors, we love ourselves, and show mercy to them. Now, Jesus hadn't broken the Sabbath. So what was the real reason that they wanted to kill him? Well, this was merely an excuse, a reason to do away with Jesus. They knew it was the right thing to do, to show mercy on the Sabbath. Jesus even pointed out her, their hypocrisy by the fact that they would frequently show mercy to their animals. If their animal fell into a ditch, they would lift it out. If, they, if their animal needed water, they would lead their animal to the water so the animal could drink. They were showing mercy to their animals. They knew they should also show mercy to others. That's not why they wanted to kill Jesus. They wanted to kill him was because they hated him. 
because he was popular with the people of Israel, because he could do miracles, miracles that prove that he was actually the Christ, something they could not bring themselves to admit, even though they knew. They knew he was the Messiah. Remember, there was one occasion where Jesus cast out demons, and he was obviously showing that he had come to destroy Satan's kingdom, and when he did that, they accused him of actually being in league with the devil, even though obviously he could not be. The reason why they were guilty of the sin which was unpardonable is because they knew he was the Messiah, and they still refused to acknowledge it. They hated the fact that what Jesus said exposed their sin and exposed their hypocrisy. They didn't want to give up their position. They didn't want to give up their power. They liked what they had. Jesus referred to them in one of his parables in Luke 19, 14. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. This is the heart of the leaders. This was what was in their minds. This is why they rejected him. As a matter of fact, this is why any reject Jesus Christ, because they hate him. And they do not want him to rule over them. Now, some of you here this morning haven't received Jesus. Some of you haven't trusted Jesus. And why haven't you? Is it because you hate him as well? Is it because you don't want him to reign over you? Is it because you don't want Jesus to tell you what to do? Is it because he calls you to give up everything, to lay down your life and to follow after him? You know, the fact that you think this way is really evidence that what the Bible says is true regarding the condition of your heart. Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 7 and 8, the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You see, you can hear everything that we've heard. You can see everything that we've seen. You can even believe these things are true, but you're never going to actually receive the Lord Jesus Christ as long as you are in this condition. You need something more. You need what the Jews needed. You need a change of heart, and only the Holy Spirit can change your heart. Only He can break the power of the flesh that keeps you in bondage. Only He can give you a new spirit and a new inclination. Now, I'm, I'm happy to say this morning that that's what the Lord says He will give you. Those of you who haven't received Jesus, those of you who haven't trusted Jesus, those of you who need the Spirit of God, who need a new heart, He says He will give it to you if you will simply come and ask Him for it. The Lord is merciful. The Lord is gracious. I mean, the fact that we're here this morning is evidence of that very thing. Jesus came into the world to save those who are bound by their sins. Jesus won't turn you away. If you come to Him, He will receive you. Come and receive Him. Come and ask Him for His mercy and see if He is not a gracious God. Now, secondly... The Jews were wondering if somewhere along the line their leaders had changed their minds. He says in verse 26, look, he is speaking publicly and they are saying nothing to him. The rulers do not really know that this is the Christ, do they? Now the one that they, uh, they said that they wanted to kill was now in the temple. He was teaching the people, but the leaders were doing nothing about it. Do the leaders now suppose that this really is the Christ? Now, were the people right about this assessment? Well, of course not. Uh, the leaders hadn't changed their minds. They still wanted to kill him. It's just that Jesus was now in front of an audience. And some of these people believed this is still the time of Jesus' popularity. If they happened to take him and try to arrest him right now, it would start a riot in the city, which would bring the Roman officials down on them. And that wouldn't go well for them because the people were out of control. 
No, remember that the Jews, the leaders of the Jews, were a little bit smarter than that. They knew that if they were going to take Jesus and arrest him, they had to do it secretly. That's why Jesus, you'll recall, did not go up to the feast publicly with his brothers, but he went in secret because it wasn't yet his time to die. No, the leaders hadn't changed their minds, but you know, it, it raises an interesting question. Would it have made any difference if the leaders had believed? Well, I think it would make a difference, although we need to realize that what our leaders do is not going to necessarily change the hearts of the people that they're governing. But we do have to recognize this. If the leaders had actually changed their minds and believed Jesus was the Christ and loved Him and trusted Him and loved God, the people would have been far more inclined to listen to Jesus. By the way, as you're reading through the book of 1 Chronicles, I want you to notice how the people tended to follow the kings. If the king was godly, they would, be, they would tend to be godly. If the king was evil, they would tend to do what was evil. That's the kind of effect that leadership has. When the leaders of a country are godly, the country goes in a godly direction. When they're ungodly, well, again, I would just encourage you to look around, read the newspaper. You see what happens when you have ungodly leadership. The country follows them. You know, it's interesting that in the uh, history of the church that when the church was doing missionary work, they would try to evangelize the king and the leader of those particular nations. They would try to convert him because if they could convert him, then the rest of the country would, would become Christian. <laughs> they would go that direction. Now, there is some wisdom in that, but we need to realize that isn't enough. The people's hearts need change. By the way, what's true in the leadership of the government is also true in the home, and it's also true in the church, and it's also true with regard to other influences around us. If we have godly influences, it will help us to go a godly direction. If we have ungodly influences, we'll go an ungodly direction, which is, of course, what um, these Jews were experiencing. But let's not forget that whatever kind of leadership we happen to be under, the Lord still holds us accountable to do what is right. Even if we have an ungodly government, even if we happen to be, God forbid, in an ungodly church, if we have ungodly influences in our family, if we have ungodly friends, which, of course, our Lord tells us not to, we need to be careful because we must do what is right even if we are around those who are encouraging us to do what is wrong. If God calls you to do one thing, but the authorities are telling you to do something else or influencing you to do something else, you need to realize that what God says is still what you must do. Even as the apostles, when they were commanded by the leaders of Israel, you are no longer to teach or preach in the name of Jesus. They said, we can't do that. We must obey God rather than men. Now, this evening, we're going to be reminded that that is exactly what the Spirit of God inside of you is giving you the desire to do. It's not just this commandment coming to you from outside and you have to somehow work up the strength to do it. The law of the Spirit of Christ within you is giving you the power to walk according to the commandments of God. So Jesus changes your heart from the inside out. He gives you the desire to do what's right so that you can do what's right. But we still need to be reminded to yield to the Spirit as He leads us in the will of God. Now, the third question they asked, and this is perhaps one of the more interesting ones, is they wondered how Jesus could possibly be the Christ since they knew where He came from. I thought that was an interesting point, verse 27. However, we know where this man is from, but whenever the Christ may come, no one knows where He is from. Now, what do they mean by that? Well, it doesn't mean that they didn't know where he was going to be born, quite obviously. Because Herod, when the wise men came and they said, where is this one who's been born king of the Jews? Herod said, well, I need to find out so I can kill him. And so he called for the chief priests and the scribes. And we read in Matthew 2, verses 4 and 6, when he asked them, they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for that is what was, has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people 
Israel. And you know that when Herod heard this, he sent his soldiers to find him and to kill him. As a matter of fact, the Jews are even going to use the fact that Jesus came out of Galilee rather than from Bethlehem as a reason to reject him. In John chapter 7, verses 40 through 43, we read this. Some of the people, therefore, when they heard these words, were saying, this certainly is the prophet. Others are saying, this is the Christ. So others are saying, surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Has not the Scripture said that the Christ comes from the descendants of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So a division occurred in the crowd because of him. We don't know where the Christ comes from. Isn't that true of the Christ? Well, how can that be true? Because they know he was going to be born in Bethlehem in the house of David. Well, that's not what they were talking about. They were talking about something else, something that was a mystery to them. And that had to do with his conception and his birth. Now, Isaiah writes in Isaiah 7, verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Now, every time we read that verse, we know exactly what this verse means. We know that because we've been taught that, because we have the New Testament to remind us that this is talking about the Spirit of God conceiving Jesus in the womb of the virgin. But just picture yourself as an Old Testament Jew without the New Testament, and you read that passage, and you say, how can this be? Where This is the Messiah, but, but how did he get there? Where is he going to come from? Uh, they didn't understand this. Now, they thought they understood Jesus, though. Okay? Jesus, as far as they could see, was born of Joseph and Mary. There was nothing supernatural about that. And he was raised in Nazareth of Galilee. He's, he's from Galilee. He's a Nazarene. He can't be the Christ. And yet, that's exactly who he is. Even though they didn't understand it, even though they didn't know, that's who He is. He is the one who was conceived in the womb of the virgin. The one that God sent to be the only Savior of mankind. You realize Joseph himself had a very difficult time understanding this virgin conception. And he had a mind to put Mary away, that is to divorce her. Matthew writes in Matthew 1 verses 20 through 21. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, I do want you to notice the angel said to name him Jesus. And the reason was because he would save his people from their sins. The name Jesus is really a sentence in the Hebrew transliterated into Greek, which means Yahweh or Yah, um, the covenant name of God, is salvation. Jehovah or Yahweh, Shua or Yahshua, Joshua. Basically, the name Jesus in Greek is the Greek name for the name Joshua, which means... Jehovah or the Lord, Yahweh, is salvation. He is the one who is able to save. He is the one who is able to save you. He's the one who has saved you if you've trusted Him. All you need to do is look to Jesus Christ and be saved because He is the Savior that God sent into the world. You don't have to understand everything about Him. And nobody, when they come to Christ, actually does. And those of us who have known Him for many years, we still don't understand certain things about Jesus because it's beyond our comprehension in many different ways. But we do know this. You don't have to understand everything. All you have to know is that He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the one that God sent into the world to save mankind. Sometimes we think salvation is such a complicated thing, but do you realize that the thief on the cross, all he had to do was look to Jesus in the very last moments of his life, and he did, and he was saved. He looked to Jesus, and we read in Luke 23, 42 and 43, he prayed, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. 
And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Excuse me. In paradise. If you will just simply look to Jesus and believe, he will save you. Now again, these were the questions that the Jews had regarding Jesus. We move now to the second point, which is what Jesus had to say about himself. We read in verses 28 and 29. Then Jesus cried out in the temple, teaching and saying, You both know me and know where I, where, where I am from, and I have not come of myself. But he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. Now, what did Jesus mean by that? Jesus is simply saying, I am the Christ. Now, he admits that they know him and where he's from, but you know what? There's another possible way to understand what Jesus said here, and I think it's more likely. I think Jesus is asking the question rather than making a statement. Do you know me and where I am from? Well, Jesus understood that they, under, you know, they knew part of it. They knew he was from Nazareth of Galilee. They knew his parents, but did they really know him? Did they really know where he was from? Well, no, not really. Jesus is really here answering the question where the Christ was going to come from by pointing out where it is he came from. The Father sent him. He came down from heaven. He didn't come down because it was his choice alone. He didn't come down on his own initiative. The Father sent him into the world, and we know that he did that through the virgin birth, which was basically the Father's uniting the eternal Son, the divine Son, with a human nature in the womb of the virgin in order that he might be the Savior of the world. Now, who is this one the Father sent? Jesus says, the one who knows him because he is from him. What Jesus means by this is he sent the one with whom he is in the most intimate of relationships with the Father because he is his son. I believe he's alluding to those later verses in Isaiah. In Isaiah 9, 6, if the Jews couldn't figure out the virgin conceiving the son, how could they figure this out? For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. This child who was to be sent into the world, the one that was to be conceived in the womb of the virgin, was not going to be an ordinary person, but it was going to be God in human flesh, the one Jesus knows, the one that the Father knows, and sent into the world, even as we are made, you know, what we're very well aware of from John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. Jesus is saying, that is who I am. You really don't know where I came from, so let me tell you, the Father sent me from heaven to be the Savior of the world, and I am a son. I am the one who knows him. Now, I want you to know that Jesus was also quick to point out that these Jews to whom he was speaking did not know him. They did not know the one who sent him. They did not know the Father, because if they had, they wouldn't have rejected Jesus. They would have received Jesus. They would be believing in him. Jesus says in his high priestly prayer, which is later in the Gospel of John, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's what eternal life is, not just the duration of life, not just the quality of life, but it's a relationship. Jesus says, I know him, but you do not know him. And the reason why you don't know him is because you haven't received his son. Now, let me ask you again this morning, do you know him? Do you know Jesus? Do you know the Father? Do you believe the Father sent Jesus into the world? Do you believe that he is who he said he, he is, God's son? 
And are you in this personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ? That's the only way that you can have eternal life, is by trusting Jesus, by believing in Jesus, by receiving Jesus. That's what eternal life is. If you don't have this relationship, if you don't love Him, you really don't know Him. And if you don't, I would again invite you this morning to trust in Jesus, to come to Him and to receive Him. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the only way of salvation. Now, finally, let's look at the result among the Jews who were listening to Him. We see, not surprisingly, they were divided. Most of them did not believe, but there were many, by God's grace, who actually did. First of all, we see there were those who didn't believe. Verse 30, so they were seeking to seize Him, and no man laid his hand on Him because His hour had not yet come. Now, there were some whose minds weren't changed, their hearts weren't changed, they still hated Him, still wanted to kill Him. So they tried to arrest him, but they couldn't arrest him because the time when he would be given into their hands in order to be crucified, in order to die, in order to be raised again, had not yet come. Well, these first, we see, did not believe, but thankfully there were those who did, many who did. Verse 31, but many of the crowd believed in him, and they were saying, when the Christ comes, he will not perform more signs than those which this man has, will he? And of course, the expected answer is no. Nobody could really do that. Now, why is it that these believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, they say it's because they saw the miracles that he did. And certainly, the miracles have a lot to do with it. Jesus had to prove that he was the Messiah, and the signs that he did actually proved that what he was saying was true. Remember when John sent messengers to Jesus, he was in prison and he didn't know, quite, you know, know what, quite what to think about him. Are you the expected one or should we look for someone else? Well, look at what Jesus said to them to say to John in Matthew 11 verses 4 through 6. Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Jesus was saying that I am doing the things that Christ was to do, the things that only the Christ could do, and the crowd saw that. And they believed. They couldn't conceive of anyone doing anything more than what Jesus had already done. He had already proven Himself to be the Messiah. This must be Him. But again, we have to ask the question that they believe because they saw these miracles firsthand. There were many more people who saw the same things they saw, and yet they did not believe. Remember what Jesus said to Thomas in John 20, verse 29. Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Now, the Spirit of God does not need to work through miracles that can be seen firsthand. I've already mentioned to you, Jesus can't be here in every age to prove that He is the Christ. He did that once and for all when He came into the world and He had what He had done written down by those who did see so that you could believe without seeing, so that the Spirit of God could bear witness in your hearts to this testimony so that you could have eternal life. So again, I would ask you this morning, do you believe? Do you believe His Word? Do you believe this testimony of, of these eyewitnesses? Do you believe the witness the Spirit of God is bearing to that word if, in fact, He is bearing that witness in your hearts? There is a general witness that He bears to all men. He convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Do you sense that? And do you have even more? 
Do you have that witness of the Spirit that proves to you that what these witnesses say is true, that Jesus is in fact the Christ? Have you trusted Jesus as your Savior and have you submitted to Him as your Lord? If you have, then you have eternal life. But if not, I would again invite you to do so this morning. God really did send His Son into the world. Jesus really did die on the cross for sinners. He really was raised again from the dead. Jesus is a real Savior. He is the only Savior. And He will save you from a very real hell, which we all deserve, if you will only believe and receive Him and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust Jesus, and He will save you. May the Lord grant that all of us would listen and respond. Now, this evening, as I've told you already, we're going to see a little bit more about how we can know whether or not we have trusted Jesus, whether or not we have received the Spirit of God, how we can know that we are genuine believers, and that is through that work of the Holy Spirit giving us that love for Christ. I would encourage you to come back this evening because the, uh, the sermon is, is, is very good. And it's one that we, we all need to hear. But let's bow for a few moments of prayer now and let's ask the Lord to help us receive what it is that He has said in His Word.